Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you and to gather here um, with our sweet Sangha. I have to be honest, it's one of the only Zooms I look forward to. <laughs> I do a lot of Zooms, but this one I'm like, don't have any of that Zoom dread, so that's nice. Um, and I just want to remind people that we are managing to keep the Dharma Collective rolling along and we're hoping to move into a physical space at some point when it feels safe and doable. And so your donations and your generosity are incredibly helpful. And then we're also really feeling dedicated to keeping our teachers um, teaching. It feels so urgent to have dedicated teachers and who we are so lucky to have these deep deep relationships with teachers like it's I think that um for me anyways when I read about the Buddhism of the past and the teacher-student relationship that I always desperately longed for yeah. and was like missing yeah. in the West the bottleneck of that connectedness was always very painful for me and I feel like at the collective we we found a way to make some really solid relationships so and the slogan tonight is about merit which sometimes I don't fully understand so I'm really looking forward to talk about it like if it's not just a tit for tat karma kind of thing, I think it's a lot more complex than that. But we could think of keeping the Dharma Collective going and our teachers teaching as a form of merit for people that come here next week when after the election they really need it. And then the week after, like there's something that feels very um, profound about that to me. So Katie will put some, did put some Donna Venmo links in the chat box. Thanks. Thanks all and welcome. Really nice to be here. I was, um, Chandra was holding forth the last two weeks and I really missed being here, which is a, a nice feeling. I wanna, just before I get started, um, this evening we have yet again, I, I know what you all covered last week, a bit of a complex um, slogan and, and this week is also complex, but happily it's actionable. Um, and my hope for us tonight is that we put it into action immediately. Um, and that is going to be that we actually try out the instructions of what we need to do next on this path of following these Lojong slogans. I want to say before we get started on that, um, and Katie, I could be wrong, but I, I know her as Kyra Jewell. Um, Thank you. No problem. So Kyra Jewell, who Katie mentioned, um, I just want to like overemphasize how incredible she is. I had the opportunity to sit with her um, and teach with her a number of years ago. She was a, um, a nun with Thich Nhat Hanh for 15 years. Um, her embodied and deep understanding of compassion blows me away. And her like joy in the world is just infectious. Um, she currently leads the um, BIPOC Sangha at Garrison once a week and is just an incredible human. So if you can on Saturday invest an hour and you've never heard of this teacher, um, I really, I really recommend that. And I recommend the Death Sangha, but I liked your uh, feeling, Katie, with resource. Um, meditating on impermanence, you're going to get a flavor of that as we start our night together. And, you know, maybe it'll give you a sense. Is this where I want to dig deeper? Um, is this what I want to do? So so excited we have all these events coming up and without further ado I welcome you to the San Francisco Dharma Collective I'm Eve Ekman myself and Chandra Easton Lopan Chandra we hold this well of being we are making our way through slowly and beautifully these Lojong slogans and these Lojong slogans they are intended to not just help us in terms of guidance for meditation practices will be guiding as we have been an opening practice of really developing clarity, stability, and spaciousness of the mind. They also help us by truly giving us these invocations, these ideas that really kind of possibly can transform how we think about our everyday life. And these Lojong slogans, I was reading one of the many great teachers who's written on Lojong, Alan Wallace today, and he says, they are not just the phrases that turn our mind, as in kind of change it, but they are the, the phrases that create a revolution. So another way we think of turning the mind is to completely revolve, to have it move all the way around. So these slogans help us with that. And as you, many of you may remember, we, on our very first night of Lojong, we practiced the preliminaries. And I really like to keep bringing them back. 
there is no way that we can, I would say, overdo the preliminaries. And they really help us with our motivation of practicing together. So before we practice the preliminaries, I just want to remind us that we are in a conscious, connected collective tonight. We have chosen to be here. And as we show up as practitioners, I invite us to do so embodying the mindfulness and compassion that we want to cultivate. And that means that there are some people on, their, on this call tonight who maybe it's your very first time joining the collective and we welcome you. We really want you to feel welcome. We want you to feel at ease and as much as possible safe. We endeavor here to create a sense of shared community, shared ethic, and that ethic is really one of non-harming. So in our thoughts, our minds, our speech, can we really engage with this non-harming with one another? So before we begin, maybe just give yourself a moment um, for the, those who are on screen and even for the names to just really recognize that we are here with others. We're practicing with others. And then we want to hold each other with that respect, with that care. Hi. Yeah. And to consider others when maybe they are asking questions in chat, when they are suggesting something around their own views that we hold this really inner feeling of non-harming, non-aggression, and practicing that with others, of course, helps us with ourselves, being non-harming and non-aggressive to ourselves. So tonight, we endeavor to bring this together for ourselves and for others as a way to be in community. So with that, we will begin our practice and we will start with the preliminaries and then do again, some of these practices that we call settling the mind in its natural state. Or as Chandra was explaining to you, it's really a shamatha in which the object is the mind itself. So uh, focus, attention, training, right on the mind, not on a candle flame, not on the sensation of breath at your nostril, attending closely to the mind. So let's begin by establishing our posture inviting the qualities of relaxation and ease. And also finding a strength rising up, the quality of vividness, wakefulness. You can imagine inhaling, feeling that vividness and wakefulness rising up from the sit bones through the spine. And then exhale, finding an ease, a softness, a gentleness. Noticing whether the head is balanced gently on the top of the neck with eyes either closed or softly hooded open. Gaze comfortably down in front of you. Feel a slight lift of the chest, a fullness of breath in the belly. And support from the chair or cushion or bed beneath you. Let's begin by simply allowing whatever is here. Noticing the sensations in the body and the mind. And being curious. about what it's like to be here in this moment, in this body and in this mind.
as much as possible, allow this knowing of what is here to be non-conceptual. So not thinking I'm tired or hungry, I'm excited, I'm eager. Instead, feel into the presence of what's here. And gently invite the body to settle into its natural state. A state of stillness and of ease. Consider setting a commitment to simply letting the body experience stillness. If an itch arises or some kind of pain, give yourself just a moment before reacting or responding. And settle the inner speech. That narration of what is happening. Sometimes critical, sometimes supportive. Releasing it, allow the mind instead to rest with the natural rhythm of the breath. Noticing the breath as it travels in and noticing the breath as it travels out. And now continue this process of settling, by no means finished. This ongoing process of attending to our body, our speech, and now the mind. As much as is possible, releasing distraction, releasing grasping towards the future. Releasing our grasping towards the past. And in its place, refreshing our interest moment to moment in the simple rhythm of the breath. Each time you're caught up in a distraction and notice you've been carried away. Just take a moment to relax, release whatever has captured your attention and simply return to noticing moment to moment the breath traveling in and traveling out as we're settling into the body, the speech and the mind in their natural states.
And with this ongoing practice of settling, we'll invite in a review <clears throat> of these preliminary practices. These very first ways in which we ready the mind, providing ourselves the insights and opportunities that remind us why we come together and practice. The first preliminary for us to simply let settle in the mind, to reflect upon, is the preciousness of human life. And in particular, the good fortune of life in an environment in which you can hear the teachings So the first preliminary, reflecting on this precious human life. How rare, how wonderful, not just to live and eat and rest, but to possibly have this revolution of our mind through the teachings, to become free. The second preliminary for us to reflect upon is the simple reality of death, and that it can come suddenly and without warning. Inviting us here to not put off these teachings that are so beneficial, so helpful, so immediately necessary. And the third preliminary practice for us to simply reflect upon, letting it turn in our mind, noticing how it feels to consider. This is to consider the entrapment of karma, whatever you do, whether virtuous or not, further brings you into the chain of cause and effect. So whether in body, in speech, in mind, or in action and behavior, there is an impact of our virtuous and non-virtuous events. And the last of the preliminaries is to recall the intensity and inevitability of suffering that each of us experience and that all beings experience.
And from these somewhat difficult yet illuminating reflections, and take a moment to come up with your intention for practicing here. Considering how this intention might relate to the greater goal of awakening bodhicitta, our absolute care of all beings. And gently releasing your intention, feeling it as a presence behind you, above you, below you. And we'll, we'll shift now into this practice of settling the mind into its natural state in which we effectively lean back in our own mind. And notice the thoughts, memories, and images which arise and fall. Just as we notice the sounds that arise and fall outside of our windows. We sharpen and focus our attention by attending to these movements of the mind. And generating more and more stability to not get pulled away and instead find stillness in motion, the stillness of our mind amid the motion of the thoughts coming and going, like a hawk kiting into the wind. For this practice, having the eyes softly opened allows in both a clarity, a vividness, and breaks down the idea that our awareness is in here. Instead, feel our awareness everywhere. The key to this practice is vivid and relaxed attention.
Apply introspection to notice when the mind has become distracted or dull. And keep refreshing this interest. Noticing thoughts as they arise, but maintaining that easeful relaxation in the awareness. does not matter how many thoughts surface or how many times you get carried away. We develop the shamatha by returning and returning and returning. Gently bringing the eyes closed and gathering the awareness back into the field of the body. Placing the attention gently on the rise and the fall of the breath at the belly. And for a moment, reflect on the kindness of yourself to yourself to be here tonight. That basic core desire to be free, to be connected. And receive this simple act of loving kindness towards ourselves. before we open our eyes and re-engage, just becoming aware that we are in a field of practice right now.
Thank you all for your practice. Any questions on the practice before we move to the slogan? You can put your questions in the chat. You can reach out to Mace or me directly if you would prefer to do that. I know you guys have been <clears throat> doing a bit of this practice of the settling of the mind, of the shamatha to the mind. Curious if it's getting harder, easier, staying the same. find that practice to be both deceptively simple and deceptively hard. And a deceptively simple in that it really is just leaning back in your mind and having the thoughts and images um, come through. And it's also deceptively hard because it's very hard to know exactly how to be with those thoughts, memories and images as they are coming through. There's a desire to do something with them. I want to label them. I want to um, understand them. Maybe I need to think about them later. So this kind of gentle, relaxed, vivid attention, it's, it's a, it's, it can be really challenging. We're observing without criticism or holding spaciously, but not getting spaced out. I think one of the near enemies of this practice could be just kind of blissing out into an openness without the precision and specificity of the shamatha that we're trying to develop, the attention we're trying to develop. And another could be getting really analytic, like, ooh, there's my past again. Ooh, there's my future. Oh, and then we're really practicing labeling. You know, we're not practicing this more kind of um, supple letting in and letting out of our thoughts. It's a wonderful practice for developing our meta awareness so that of course we're practicing it here together on the cushion but when we are for example on a different kind of zoom call <laughs> maybe one for work and we're listening to someone else speak and all of a sudden we have an idea like they are completely wrong or they are completely right and i agree and i can't wait to tell them and that has pulled us out of the moment we're no longer listening Part of this practice is we're developing that ability to see, oh, there's that thought I have. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna continue listening and be present. So we're developing a skill and a tool that's very actionable. Um, yeah, so I hope, I hope that's helpful. Um, someone wrote to me that tonight my body was really jumpy and distracted from the shamatha, um, not so much in the mind. So what do we do? Um, and they also said they decided to accept it, which is exactly right. Um, you know, agitation in the body can come from so many different reasons. It can literally be that we do have a lot of energy we haven't used. We haven't been outside or we haven't been moving. It can also be a, a whole host of different emotions going on for us. Um, allowing the body to just kind of settle, not interfering. Occasionally, if the body is feeling kind of jumpy, it might be helpful to kind of attend to the body lovingly, almost like you're shaking hands with that sensations in the body. So if it becomes so kind of loud and bright, it's hard to avoid it. Maybe just noticing, you know, there is jumpiness, there is heaviness, being kind of kind and gentle. Because um, with this practice, really, truly, we're in the mind. This is, this is, and we are, we're not trying to attend to sensations. It's a really specific practice in that way. 
Okay, so our slogan, and I mean, I'm curious also, <laughs> in case anybody wants to, um, the slogans, um, the preliminary slogans are hard and they almost feel a bit cruel. Like, why are you asking me to remember the preciousness of human life, the reality of death, <laughs> the entrapment of karma and the intensity and inevitability of suffering? Like, why, why is that a good idea? And I think part of it is, is both super humanizing, recognizing that all of this happens to all of us and also to give us that really intense motivation of why we practice. It would be much easier to put off practice to some other time when we were less busy or less tired or less whatever. So as part of our motivation needs to come with, wow, death could come at any moment. And for any of you who've had the experience of um, being with someone as they're dying, you know that these practices are really helpful. They're helpful for the person who's witnessing. And if the person is fortunate enough to have the practices while they're dying, it can be an enormous support, enormous support. We want to be able to find ourselves at the point when we are facing death to have that presence of mind, that openness of heart. I won't go so as, as far to say that our practice is an insurance policy, but I have to be honest, I sometimes think of it that way. How can I ensure with as much possible hope as, as, as is um, allowable that I'm working on something that will help me die well? And yeah, I eat healthy, I exercise, I, I do those things. But the mind, working on the mind and the heart, it's essential. And this, you know, karma too, it's interesting. <laughs> so much of our daily life, there is no one around us to tell us what we should and shouldn't do. There's no ethical barometer that says, ooh, maybe you shouldn't be multitasking as you're talking with your friend on the phone, right? Or maybe you shouldn't write, um, yeah, cut corners on this project. Maybe it's actually important you give your full attention. So how do we kind of have a sense of internalizing the importance and value of each and every thought, each and every thing that we're saying, each and everything that we're doing without having it feel too strict and rigid, right? Because we don't want to think like, oh my God, I, I totally lost it at that person in the park who's, who wasn't wearing a mask. I'm, I'm such a bad Buddhist. I have so much uh, practitioner shame. I'll never recover. But we do want to continue to hold ourselves to standards internally and externally, right? That really are honoring karma, which is if we are moving in unvirtuous ways in the world, unvirtuous things in the world will follow, right? That's just, that's just how it is. Um, not because we're bad or wrong, but simply because we are kind of forging the path ahead step by step. That can be not just a simple idea that you can apply because you should. It's one that we could see throughout any scientific study, physics, right? Um, so just really trying to get ourselves on board with internalizing the importance and value of working towards karma that is virtuous, that is wholesome for us. Okay, so those are hopefully a good reason to practice the preliminaries, sometimes awkward though they are. Um, Walt, hi Walt, um, perhaps due in large part to both the pandemic worldwide and this country's political and social divide. Focusing during practice has become more difficult because I feel myself drifting in to uh, the salve of pleasant reverie to avoid what is. Interesting. I'm impressed, Walt, that you can find a pleasant reverie. Um, so that that's that's uh, that's definitely a feat in this moment. And you know, it's interesting. I I, I can appreciate that um, that concern or consideration. And this is a time of very acute stress for a lot of us, on top of a time of ongoing stress or maybe lifelong and chronic stress. So this is really a pretty dense moment. And what our how our practice is showing up for us is, is very interesting. 
And there might be some kind of inner wisdom rising up to meet you there, Walt, of just I what what my mind and body really need for refreshment is to engage in some sense of pleasantness, some sense that something is good right now. And I, you know, it's um, our practice at its very best is us feeling as though we're in, a, in an apothecary, that we have access to all these different kind of herbs and tinctures and salves, and we apply them as we know is necessary to settle our body, our speech, and our mind, to have our heart feel expansive and open. So though I am tonight in this role of being your guide, I may not know what's best for you in your mind. Um, and so of course the guidance is, is offered, but I think if there's a place to find that refreshment and peace, I'm all for it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, let's get into the, I always wanna say the meat of the practice, but my friend Ryan often says the tempe of the practice. Um, so our slogan, we're on slogan 15. I'm gonna write it here for you. In, an, in a very, it, it is very unintuitive when you first read it. So uh, here we go. One moment here to everyone. The slogan tonight is four practices are the best of methods. But what are those four practices? And one thing I wanna invite us to do is, as I mentioned before, is to really consider actually how we can apply these four practices. If, if these are the best of methods, if these are the practices that are truly gonna help us in this path of um, our Lojong training to transform all adversity into the path, then maybe we should really apply these practices tonight. So the first one is the practice of accumulating merit. The second one is laying down our evil deeds. The third is offering to the dons, which I will explain. And the fourth is offering uh, to the dharmapalas, which I will also explain. So the first practice of accumulating merit, it's really interesting, Mace kind of foreshadowed here that Merit can have a weird feeling. It can feel a little transactional. It can very easily get co-opted by our materialist culture. But when we think of what accumulating merit is, it's really you know, engaging intentionally in these acts that are really essentially good deeds or, or wholesome acts. This is, includes something um, around devotion. Maybe we revere a sacred image. Um, this can be supporting our Sangha Right? So as giving in the dana, this can also be, you know, um, kind of simple things that we're really um, doing on a day to day basis that are kind that are generous. And when we're generating merit, we're really doing so with this full intention for how it can benefit our mind to wake up for the sake of all beings. Now, because of the world uh, that we live in and the world that has always been we can in some ways exchange merit. So the way that merit gets a little funky, I think for some of us is you see, um, of course, in the time of the Buddha and up until now, you have monks whose entire life is generating merit. They're practicing all day. They are really adhering to the sacred texts, to the sacred practices. But most of us, we have a job. We're doing something else. And so we can gain some of their merit by giving an offering offering food, offering um, some support or sustenance. And so it's this exchange of merit that's of really mutual benefit. But that doesn't really work if you're just doing it, you know, in a, in a kind of transactional, unthoughtful way. Oh yeah, I should give those monks the food because they're praying and maybe some of the goodness will come to me. There has to be a mutual honoring there with that kind of exchange of merit. And I think when we are trying to accumulate our own merit, it isn't so good things will happen to us. We're accumulating the merit by knowing that adhering to these acts in and of itself, again, will bring forth that karma that is more beneficial for us. So when I'm thinking of accumulating merit, I think of actually, luckily of, of the four things tonight, we are all engaging with it because we are all supporting the Sangha by being here. 
And when we bring teachings to others or when we support others, we're really generating merit. It's really, I, I, I definitely have had times when I thought that generating merit was something that kind of protected me from harm. Oh, I've generated so much good merit. I'm, I'm gonna be really good. I'm really, I'm not gonna have any issues coming ahead because I've, I've just been practicing and dedicating myself to the Dharma. And it doesn't work that way. <laughs> that is very disappointing. It makes us feel really like pretty lousy. Um, you know, if we get a little bit too, you know, um, again, giving for the hope of receiving. So accumulating merit, it's, it's just so interesting for us to do and not have it kind of get into this egoic sense of possessiveness right? Of like, I, I'm doing this good and I want something in return. So one way that we are really helping ourselves is to accumulate merit for the sake of merit, for the sake of benefit. Any questions on that first one, which I think is quite tricky? Mace, I'm curious, how does that strike you? Sorry to call on you, but you know. It's great. Um, I really like the part where you said it's not transactional and that it's not like magic, right? So it's not casting a magic ring around you. But I kind of think of it and when you said that, you said the two and then I've been thinking about, <clears throat> I do think that the practice is a form of protection, but I think the only thing it protects is your heart. Mm. You know, so that it's like, that story that just is so profoundly moving and I'm going to get it wrong, but the Dalai Lama's colleague or compatriot who was in prison forever in Tibet. And then he finally gets released or whatever and comes to the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala. And there's some exchange and the Dalai Lama asks him how he is. And he said, Oh, you know, like it was almost really bad. And the Dalai Lama was like, well, yeah, it was bad. Right. You got, you were in prison and it was awful. And, and the guy says, no, no, I almost started to hate the guard. Something mm. like that. Some yeah. story like that. Yep. Um, that story is so moving to me. Mm. It's like, I think the most moving Buddhist story out there. And it's mm. like, may, may, may the practices and the merit and the devotion and the dedication. I mean, I'm so far from that guard, that guy and the guard, <sighs> but like, may it eventually protect my heart that way. Hmm. So I think maybe after hearing you talk about it, I just think, you know, our capitalist culture makes everything so transactional that it's yeah. really easy to get confused about it. Yeah. 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 I'm talking about yeah. because it comes up, the word comes up a lot. Yeah. The teaching. So I appreciate that we're talking about it tonight. Yeah. I really love your beautiful framing of that, that you're generating the merit for the protection of your own heart. <laughs> And then that heart, of course, is more available to others. And, you know, at the end of our time together in almost every class, we dedicate our merit. And what does that mean, right? We've generated something good being here and we're offering it to others. And that is a beautiful part of our merit. And I, I was reading about merit because I also feel a little confused about it. It seems like, oh, I did something good. I sew, sew a badge on my, uh, on my sash or on my coat. Like, I'm good. I did a merit. Um, it was actually, it predates Buddhism, this idea of merit. And it was often something that you did on behalf of your loved ones who had passed away. So in these more indigenous or um, like shamanic approaches, the idea of merit was something you generated for your ancestors, which I think is also a beautiful way of thinking about it because obviously there's not a, a direct transactional there. You're paying it backwards, right? May they be free, may they be safe. I'm gonna do this good work in the world for them. Oof, that actually really moves me. And this idea that we can donate our merit to other beings, right? Who may not, of course, directly be like, whoa, what was that? Oh, someone just gave me merit. I feel great. Like, <laughs> it's not like they get that hit of our merit, but that we both generate it and freely offer it, right? That's the whole practice. And um, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this quite a lot of, um, you know, the things that we are engaging with in the world that are just hard, that don't feel good, but we know they are good. 
so many different ways that can show up. Like maybe one of our friends who continues to make the same wrong choice over and over. And we kind of want to just be like, ah, I'm not going to pick up the call. But we pick up the call, right? We feel as though that is of great benefit. It will be supportive. It'll be helpful. And we don't do it to get the merit, but we know that we're like in accordance or in adherence with our, with our highest virtues. Um, so it's, it is nice. Yeah. Just what you said about the origins of it being pre-Buddhism reminds me, I was listening to a talk the other day with Resma Menicum and Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams. And they were both like, we are our ancestors' greatest dreams, right? Like, how, how could their ancestors have even dreamed that the two of them in this world would be possible depending on how many generations you go back? And so that makes me actually think of that, hmm. that practice of like, could we be our ancestors' greatest dreams? You know, could we be the fru fruition of that? And then that merit sort of like, and in with epigenetic trauma, like also hmm. like, then you're paying it forward. Like it's actually, woo, we could just talk about this all night, really profound. So thank you. <laughs> So welcome. So the second one, this one I'm getting excited about, and this one requires actually a little bit of tech. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna preface it by the next three ones we're going to do. I, I would really like us to engage with the chat. And I learned an amazing um, teaching tool from my dear friend, Venerable Tenzin Choki. And what she did, uh, which she was also received this teaching from a, um, another friend or colleague of hers, is she went in and if you touch your own um, kind of little screen there, you have an option to rename yourself. And I invite everybody to rename themselves as human, as I did. And when we all rename ourselves as human, it means that everything we put in the chat looks exactly the same. So I'm going to ask us all as humans to respond to the next of these couple ones, just as a way for us to kind of understand that. I see a lot of humans. Wonderful. So this next one, it kind of actually gets us back to the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. Back last year when we met in person and we were looking at um, this invitation um, of Shanti Deva, who said that one of the very first ways on our path to becoming spiritual warriors is that we have to admit to our neurotic thought crimes. <laughs> we have to just get clean and get free. And as this is the way it's described in this slogan, we have to lay down our evil deeds. And essentially, this is done by just looking deeply at your own life seeing the mistakes you continue to make and then surrendering in some ways like so saying that these evil deeds um, or these neurotic thought crimes these are not me but these are absolutely in my way and so the invitation of this method right so these are the four methods uh, accumulating merit laying down our evil deeds and we do this not just by um you know committing to oh yeah, I'm gonna do less of that ruminative thing that gets in the way, but this confessional piece. So for all of us who are humans here, I invite you, please confess anonymously in your humanness. What are the ways, what are the neurotic thought crimes? So this includes obsessing about one's status in the world, comparing oneself compulsively to others, getting lost in shame, being afraid, any of these. So whatever is coming up for folks. I see coming back to harmful habits again and again. Yeah. Coming back to harmful habits again and again, 
petty jealousy of others, judgments, not seeing the good in others, perseverating about relationships, attaching to an outcome in relationships, deep unworthiness, and then acting to be good enough, still not loving myself, self-centered with anxiety, regret, remorse, sloth, being frightened of groundlessness, compare and despair. Oh, that's a good pairing. Obsessing with attempting to control things, harsh speech, often tell myself I'm a failure, not feeling good enough, needing to be better than others, competitive, gossip, spending too much time indulging in neurotic thought crimes, <laughs> being stuck in past trauma and replaying it through wrong perceptions of others. Shame, 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 maintaining my egoic, egocentric thoughts with self, hate, seeing others, others through my limited stories of them, judging, blaming out instead of looking in, so much shame. So just giving ourselves a moment here to take in this brave confession, this tenderness, and this openness to seeing that these are the ways that our intrinsic goodness can get blocked. And with a fierce compassion, considering committing as much as possible to laying these down. I'm noticing whatever comes up, feelings or thoughts. And seeing again with this fierce compassion, so this care, but this determination. I am not that which limits me. And it is time for me to go beyond. Thank you, humans. Really appreciate the sharing. We're going to move to the next of this method, again, which will I will ask you to kind of respond and reflect. This one is interesting. It's practice three is offering to the dawns. So the dawns is a source of one's misfortune. Um, these are often kind of these sudden attacks of neurosis that seem to come from nowhere. Offering to them. <laughs> it really essentially means that we look at those neurotic habits and patterns and we bow down as though they were our greatest teacher. We invite them in as though they are cherished guests in our home. So now that we've kind of generated some ideas around what these inner kind of, I, I don't like evil deeds, but that is, that is the phrasing or these inner neurotic thought crimes. How are the ways that we can actually start considering opening up, even feeling reverence towards so the story that, that Mace brought up is a perfect example of that at the most heroic level. 
So this chant master of the Dalai Lama, after 30 years of being imprisoned in a Chinese labor camp, is received by the Dalai Lama with these open arms. I missed you so. How are you? How were you? What was it like? And the chant master, as may said, said, I was so afraid. I almost lost my compassion for the guards. I was almost totally lost. And there's actually even now um, been kind of follow up and somehow they track down some of the guards. Um, and the transformation that happened among these guards of caring for all these Tibetan lamas and masters was very transformative for them. Challenging of their, their humanity when they were cruel and evil and violent and met with just love and love and love, right? So it's, it feels unfathomable. Um, and yet remembering that they were practicing from in the womb. They were practicing every day. They, you know, grew up in a field of practice like that. It's not that we're worse or wrong or different. It's, it's a different way of having been um, shown your relationship and connection to the world. And I do think it's really um, an inspiration and a really hard one to kind of offer to these dawns. So this idea that <laughs> the source of our misfortune that comes from the inside is actually what will help us wake up, that this is a gift, that it shakes us out of complacency and that we should be grateful. Which is always this thread in the Lojong, right? Always this thread in the Lojong of that adversity, that person who puts me down after I've given them everything. Oh, you are my highest teacher. And I, I actually really love being playful with this, you know? So I may, I, I have some family members who are harder for me. And I, I often think, oh, my guru, my greatest teacher, instead of God, I just wish you were different. I just, yes, just don't want it to be that way. And yeah, curious from folks, I was just reading the chat to see how is Dawn spelled. Yeah, it's a very strange little word there. You've heard now a number of versions of this, those of you who have been coming to the Lojong, like how is this resonating? How is this idea of laying down to the Dawns? And I'm gonna be specific because then the next one that we do is really actually what happens from the outside world. Um, more like when I was talking about the family member when we actually are treating our inner experiences as gurus and teachers, inner experiences as gurus and teachers. So those feelings of shame, um, those feelings of, uh, you know, being stuck, um, needing to be better. What is it like to turn towards this list and say, being frightened of groundlessness and self-centered, you are my gurus. <laughs> you are my teachers. Thank you. And that doesn't mean we, we then don't do anything, right? It's not, oh, those are my teachers. I don't need to work on that. But as, as my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood says, you, you cannot transcend what you don't accept. And unfortunately, in a lot of spiritual practice, most of us would like to totally transcend and get away from these things that really we haven't learned to accept yet. We accept, then we shift and change. But if we try to shift and change without that fundamental care, we're still trying to control it. We're not being totally honest and we're setting ourselves up for a lot of disappointment because we can't accept things as they are setting ourselves up for that mind of hope and fear. I hope I transcend this experience. I just want it to stop. God, I hope it doesn't come back again. Right now, so good. How do we transcend the mind of hope and fear and accept what arises in the mind as our teacher? So I'm looking at the chat here. 
It seems like an opportunity to develop empathy for others, recognizing our own frailty, admitting to them, yes. There is really well-proven empirical fact that of course we can have empathy for others without caring about ourselves, but it is so much more improved if we have that true empathic understanding of ourselves, that acceptance. Another human says, it seems um, it makes perfect sense. It's so hard to practice when it comes to relatives and to be centered and not lose it. Oh my God, don't I know it. I wonder, yeah, in the last, I think four or five years, I've taught um, a, a holiday session on the holiday schmear, kind of fear and shame that happens over the holidays. I, I think during COVID, we're still gonna have that, right? And now it's just kind of like mixed in all the time. Yeah, it's really hard with our relatives. That'll be the next slogan that we can get to. Um, that's why they're such good teachers. <laughs> totally persistent in, in their showing up and our feeling of responsibility to them, uh, real or imagined. Uh, welcoming everything and not fighting brings spaciousness and tenderness. Gives me the ability to work more skillfully. Thank you, yeah. Um, I think of the mantra, what if there's nothing wrong? <laughs> yeah. Our suffering can reveal what is most important to us. I love that. The one I've, I've had a similar experience of what is everything is actually already okay. Um, just such a beautiful consideration. Helps me see impermanence as a friend the only way out is through compassion versus empathy. Yes. Um, what prevents us <laughs> from generating love? Often when we are hurt, we become self-centered. We realize this, we can work on opening our hearts. Absolutely. Um, nobody wants the holiday schmear on their bagel, which I can appreciate. Um, yeah. And so our, our, our final part of this slogan is offering to the Dharmapalas. Um, and this is really, you know, if the kind of making of the guru at the inner is the third, this fourth method is making a guru of the outer. So essentially, in this practice, we actually wish for things to happen that are hard, so that we can really help us see where we've slipped, and what has happened. I heard in, in a teaching Alan Wallace was giving, he was talking about one of his great teachers, who was in Tibet, an aristocrat and a scholar. He was one of the most accomplished uh, doctors in Tibet of Tibetan medicine. And with genuine you know, authenticity, Alan says that he truly felt as though the Chinese were a force that he really felt gratitude for, not because of their harm and exploitation, but because of what it meant for him to move out of comfort into being in exile in a foreign land and how much he grew and shifted and changed from that. That is, that's the, again, very high level practice. <clears throat> and so the idea is that kind of allowing ourselves to not only take these bigger teachings, right? COVID is a big Dharmapala for us, a big gate of um, understanding when someone we love is sick or ill or dying, right? But what about like right in the moment? What about the smaller ones day to day? I think it's really interesting um, to consider those moments that feel like they're really in the way. That can be something quite simple. Maybe you had an idea of, I'm, gonna, I'm working really hard, but on Friday, I'm gonna go on a beautiful hike and it's gonna be sunny and I'm gonna feel relaxed and it's gonna be great. And then Friday, there's like 45 mile an hour winds. Then your hike is terrible. And you're like, oh, get, just getting hit every way. And your attitude is this sucks. This isn't how it should be. I hate this, right? The invitation here, quite simply, um, is that over you know, much practice, we can turn towards that as an understanding and saying, um, thank you for reminding me that we can't set our expectations. Thank you for reminding me that um, I can really delude myself. I can really have a sense that I have control over the world. Um, 
with the Dharma Paulas, we're really looking at how can we overcome our own self-deception, the ways that we expect the world to be, the ways that we imagine we could be somehow free from suffering. And there are these many, 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 many events on a day-to-day -day basis that remind us we are not. And instead of begrudging, instead of blaming, we look to them with this teaching. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> I see a lot of head shaking. <laughs> like, no, thank you. Not before the election. Don't be invoking this. <laughs> yeah. Let me hear. What do you think? How about, the question is, what, what is hard about this? But what would be nice again to do in the chat is, where or what are the things from the outer world that are really hard to include as part of your practice? This could be, again, the difficult relative. This could be um, aging body. What are the things from the outer world not your inner neurotic thoughts, but the outer world that are really hard to treat as a guru. Yeah, loneliness and aging. Anger. Politics and policies that harm many. Anxiety, panic, aging, loneliness, feeling isolated, disregarded, and worthless. Living in the middle of a construction zone, climate catastrophe, the knowledge that so many are suffering horribly while I am comfortable. Expectations, job changes, suffering that seems unnecessary, hunger and war, work, budget cuts, unemployment, the environment, plastic containers for everything. <sighs> People not wearing masks, insubstantiality and impermanence. I fight against it instead of having peace with it. Loved ones, unhappiness. Wow, this is a depressing chat. Yes. Misogyny, greed, hate. Waiting on the world to change and knowing that I am old and may die before it does. Depression. So let's take a moment here and really come into the practice, closing your eyes if that's comfortable. And feeling into whatever sensations are arising in the body as a result of reflecting upon or reading about these challenges in our world that are really hard to transform into the path. What is the embodied experience of holding these? Notice if there's a heaviness under the eyes or a weight in the jaw What's happening in the chest? Feel the belly. And tenderly and lovingly meet this embodied experience of holding And knowing 
myriad amounts of suffering, challenges, pain and difficulty in the outer world. And feel or imagine as though the breath could just gently poke in tiny little holes, little areas of spaciousness through the density of feeling. And as you breathe in, breathing in this spaciousness, I can just start to perforate expand and ventilate the embodied experience of the suffering in the world, the suffering in our world. And then as you exhale, imagine you could exhale and release out. Taking some of that heaviness, some of that weight So beginning with a fullness of feeling the weight, the challenge, the difficulty, not denying, not avoiding, not sublimating. But then inviting this compassionate transformation, this tonglen towards ourselves. Inhale, simply drawing in some lightness, some levity and exhale, extending out, releasing, pulling out some of the heaviness. Take a moment here to notice the dignity and goodness of this, attending to suffering, transforming suffering. And while this may not create the shifts and changes needed directly in the world in this moment, You can still acknowledge or feel the goodness of inclining our mind towards caring. Maybe too much of a leap to consider that Possibly these challenges, this heaviness and this difficulty is our training ground. And these situations and circumstances indeed are our gurus. But maybe for a moment, just allowing that this practice has dignity and has benefit. Opening up to these challenges, transforming them with our breath and our heart. This is the practice of the spiritual warrior, of the compassionate warrior. For that motivation, a couple more breaths of bringing in, ventilating, extending out and releasing.
I'm taking a moment here to really consider again, merit, benefit. Coming together this evening and sharing in our humanity, sharing in the teachings. May the merit of this activity together truly be of benefit to the most beings. May the merit of this time together protect our own hearts. May all beings know the goodness of belonging and connection. May all beings feel healthy and strong. May all beings be happy and free. Thank you. It was really beautiful to be with you all tonight. I really, uh, as always, need these teachings. I'm trying to convince you as I'm trying to convince me, and it ends up working out. I do know that these adversities and these challenges are indeed the path. It, it's just really painful, and I don't think we can do it alone. Yeah, thank you so much for showing up. And next week, unfathomable, the day after the election, I will be here with the dear Venerable Tanzan Choki. And if you don't know her, she's just a, an outstanding human being, amazing and magnificent teacher. And we will be together working on Slogan 16. Um, because no matter what happens, it's going to be relevant. That's the thing about low job. Um, it really is set up well to help us respond to the world just the way it is. Um, I hope you all take care of yourself. I, I do think for many of us with the news cycles is a really stressful time. So really be kind and be gentle with yourselves. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Eve. Likewise. Take Thank care. Thank you. Thanks, Eve. Thank you. Thank you, humans. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Eve. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to see you. Thank mm -hmm. you.